Welcome everyone to the fourth day of our school. Our first lecture today is Jonathan with his uh, third lecture. Third, I believe. yeah. Boy. Please, the floor <laughs> is yours. Yeah, I'm the only one who has four, so I can still do a little bit of um, um, basic stuff. And I, I was just talking to Yash, and um, I thought I'm going to, I wanted, today I want to go a little bit more into the principles of developmental biology, because what we do in the lab is trying to understand the flows of energy and matter in developing systems. But before that, you know, Sunil introduced this concept of KMs and enzyme kinetics and what it means, right? Like you also heard about allosteric regulation. And I wanted to just show you some data which came roughly from 2016. And what the people did was grinding up different kind of cells. Like you have a mammalian cell up here, you have a yeast and an E. coli cell. And what they did is they measured key metabolites, such as ATP, NAD, and all the stuff we heard, and measured their concentration, okay? And then they compared this concentration to the known KM of either active sites or inhibitory sites on the enzyme allosteric sites, like a, basically a binding constant to that. And, and then they plotted, it, plotted them against each other on a log-log graph. Can you tell me what you see? Just if you look at this upper plot. This is the, this is the known KMs in vitro, and this is the measured concentrations on particular metabolites in vivo. Any idea? Just anything goes, shoot it. Uh, sort of the concentration of metabolite, suppose if we take ATP, the red circles, mm -hmm. remain uh, the same uh, even if the KM changes. But one data point, for example, like ATP concentration is always the same, right? Because it has been measured, <laughs> all these other data points are different enzymes which bind ATP, right, with a certain KM. So what you can see is here, if the concentration would be at the KM, you would assume that these red data points fall on this line. But what you can see is that most of the concentrations of ATP is actually higher than the KM, okay? So what, what does that mean? Exactly. So it's saturated. Usually you could think about the enzyme as saturated, right? And it operates close to Vmax. So now, and you can see this, there's a general shift of a lot of metabolite concentrations above the KM of an enzyme. However, and then you can, you can plot this, for example, as a histogram for all the known enzymes. And you can see this histogram in the blue here that you know, this is the log of the metabolite concentration divided by the KM. And you can see that it's, you know, like it's, it's shifted to the right, right? So a lot of these enzymes are actually saturated of operating at, at Vmax. However, now you do this same experiment and you look at the binding constants at the allosteric side of that enzyme, right? And you, which regulates its activity. And similarly, you can see is that these are metabolic inhibitors, right? Like they kill the, the activity of the enzyme or downregulate the activity of the enzyme. And in this experiment, what you can see is that a lot of inhibitory sites, just based on this data, grinding up a cell, are also saturated based on the known binding constants of this inhibitory site in vitro. What does that tell you? Should metabolism work that work according to this data? <laughs> Who thinks metabolism works if we have this? Any, raise your hands. Who thinks metabolism shouldn't work? Data like this. <laughs> 
So what, what does it? Are we alive? So there's a problem. Do you see the problem here? Where do you think this problem is coming from? Okay. So remember, we have a binding site um, in your active site or a binding site on an allosteric site, what Sunil explained, right? Like you can have a small metabolite. You have your, you have your pathway A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And eventually D binds the enzyme from A to B in order to say, look, we have enough stuff here, slow down, or we have too little, activate, right? This is this classical allosteric feedback regulation we had about two days ago. And now you measure the concentration of that molecule which does the feedback, right? And compare that concentration to the binding site affinity and see, you know, at what concentration would that binding site to be 50% saturated? And you can see that the concentrations are way higher for a lot of these inhibitors than their binding site affinity, right? Meaning that all of these inhibitors should inhibit the enzyme, right? Based on these measured concentrations and the known affinities, right? So meaning these enzymes or these metabolic pathways should be inhibited. However, these cells are happy, are alive, and divide. Right? And this is the data you get from experiments, and then you think, okay, what is going on, right? So you can interpret this either we measure the concentrations wrong, or these KMs in vitro are very, very different from the KMs in vivo, which is a likely hypothesis, because they have been measured in dilute solutions in vitro, um, and the cell is, of course, not, a like, you know, not so dilute. The dilution is very crowded. So maybe these KMs are wrong. Okay. That could be one interpretation. Or we also learned that cells are compartmentalized. Right? And that's a principle of compartmentalization, that this is an average concentration because you grind up the cells. But of course, a lot of these enzymes are localized to different spaces in, spa in, in, in the cell. Okay? So it could mean that the effective concentration of this metabolite, for example, in your mitochondria, where it would does, does its business end, is very different from the concentration in the cytoplasm, and we know that. For example, for ATP, the mitochondrial concentration is very different from the cytoplasmic concentration. So there is, exactly, good point, right? That, E. coli. Right? So for E. coli, that may be not work, right? However, you could still imagine that even on the length scale of an E. coli, what we heard, we have a reaction diffusion systems in cells, that metabolism could be even in a dilute, in the solution of the cytoplasm of E. coli being spatially organized. And that could be also another hypothesis, and this is something we do not know. Right? If you have the cytoplasm, to what extent is the cytoplasm spatially organized in terms of their chemical? It's just like a thought experiment, just to think you like, you know, how to interpret this kind of data and generate a little bit of hypothesis and see is it consistent with what we know. And that's the conundrum. This data exists and we don't know. Okay, any questions regarding this plot? Good. And I'm just going to move on and, yeah. There have been no efforts to look into it. The problem with how we have, a, we have an experimental problem to look at fluxes and steady state concentrations of metabolites in cells. So Jingbo a little bit alluded to how we can measure metabolite, like met metabolism in space. And there is... You know, for some of them, for example, like NADH, which is out of fluorescent, we can do it. And Jingbo, I think, um, gave, some, gave some nice introductions. And I think today he's going to present his work. But then for other metabolites, we rely on these metabolic sensors. And they work in some systems. They don't work in other systems. And they're going to report steady state, right? And you may have the same steady state, but with very different fluxes, 
And so there's a problem right now. How do we deduct fluxes of metabolites in space? And if somebody finds a solution to this problem, it will be very appreciated in the field. And I think the only, the way I currently interpret it is it will combine coarse-grained models together with steady-state concentration. So I'm a bit confused about uh, what KM are we referring to in the x-axis because uh, it says mammalian cells and then the metabolites, but mm -hmm. KM can be enzyme-specific, right? It is enzyme-specific. So like which particular enzyme or is it like uh, all enzymes a particular range or how do we actually you know read the graph? I'm not still clear. So you take your enzyme, for example, take hexokinase, which is which is allosterically regulated by ATP level, right? Um, and that has a certain KM, and that's one data point on the x-axis. And of course, eight, when you measure ATP in the, in these cells, you just have one concentration. Um, so that's the reason why you have a lot of data points in this way, because ATP each like it corresponds just to the, me the once measured concentrations of ATP, but all these data points are very different enzymes. So for example, this could be pyruvate kinase, and this could be hexokinase. And so basically what they did is they measured these concentrations and then go to a database and see, you know, what are these enzymes expressed and what are the mammalian or the corresponding KM of that enzyme measured in vitro. See, so uh, can I understand it this way that the x-axis basically shows the range of KMs which refer to different enzymes. Exactly. I mean, different Very enzymes exactly. KM. Okay, okay. So finding uh, a particular metabolite. Yeah. And the okay, okay, got it. So why do you see that the um, only for negative locks you on the x-axis you see that the inhibitors are actually sorry I didn't hear the last part. The inhibitors are greater than the substrates only when on, on the on the left side of the x-axis uh, along after zero, so yeah. negative log. So why is that? Whereas in almost all the other cases, you see that you have more su substrate than the. Inhibitors. I have no idea. Something to think about. Um, Anyway, I just wanted to show you this, that we also have to think about not only time, but also space, right? Maybe that's one hypothesis to interpret this data. Or take some in vitro measurements of maybe of KMs, maybe with a little bit of a grain of salt. It's a good starting point. But what I actually wanted to do today um, is to go a little bit into the principles of developmental biology. Right? And at one point, we were talking about heredity and thinking about this beauty that we have all sides of different species and they look very, very similar, but in the end, give rise to very different. There's a nice book, which I haven't read, but it was recommended to me. Um, and I, I want to read it um, over, over Christmas break, and I think it's, it has very good critics. So think about, you know, if you looking for a new book, Philip Ball, How Life Works. But just to go a little bit into the principles of developmental biology, I just wanted to show you one movie of a zebrafish embryo developing, and it's, it's a very, very famous movie from um, Karlström and Kane. And we also use zebrafish um, in, in, in the lab as a model system, and what you're gonna see is the first 24 hours of embryonic development. If this movie is going to play, what you can see is here is nicely this the yolk where all the energy is stored. And then these cells in the beginning of development divide very synchronously, um, giving rise to an exponentially more cells, but the overall volume is conserved. And then in the end, at one point, you have a ball of cells which is shaped during a process of what we call gastrulation. And then you have the early sulfate specifications, and now you can already see that you, the embryo body plan is developing. You have a head, you have a tail, and in the end you form your vertebrae or the segment, which is because zebrafish is a vertebrate animal. And only in the time scale of 24 hours, you have this remarkable biology happening where you just have one cell and you end up with a multicellular organism 24 hours later, which has all the organs and everything already set in. 
if we now look generally as a life cycle um, during development, we can, through the, through the course of um, um, evolution, we can um, think, think about there's always um, different phases of development. So one phase, what I just showed you in the beginning, you have this, what we call the cleavage stage. So the cleavage stage is you start out with an oocyte and you make more cells. And in the end of cleavage, you end up with a, um, with a, with a ball of cells, which we call a blastula. And then you're gonna shape these ball of cells into what we call the three germ layers, the mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. So what you're trying to do is get cells inside the embryo. And afterwards, you're gonna form your organs and during orogenesis, and then particularly now, this is a frog, you have a larval stage in between where, you, where these larva basically grows and then you metamorph into a sexually reproductive adult. And if you look across different species, it's very, very particular. It's, they're very diverse in the beginning. You have very different egg sizes. They do gastrulation very, very differently. However, there's one stage, which we call the phylotypic stage, where you can just take embryos <coughs> of different species, as you can see here, fish, salamander, rotters, chicken, hog. And in this phylotypic stage, after gastrulation, during orogenesis, they all look the same. And then after that, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna increase your variability of development. And if you plot this, this is what is called the hourglass model, is that in the beginning, you, you're diverse, you reach this phylotypic stage, and then you look at this variability again. And, then, and if you summarize this, for example, you have very vastly different egg sizes, you make more cells during cleavage, and then you're gonna form your germ layers during gastrulation, and then you're gonna reach this phylotypic stage during orogenesis giving rise um, to, to your adult embryo. And then just if you look at cleavage again, this is again zebrafish embryo from the top. And what you can see is this really this nicely synchronized division. And you have some mitotic waves originating from the center. And this is due to the reaction diffusion of the cell cycle oscillator. And in the end, what you're gonna end up with is this, with this beautiful ball of cells. And cleavage is characterized by very, very rapid mitotic division, which increase the numbers of cells, right? Like this is its purpose. You start with one cell, but with one cell, you cannot form a multicellular system. So you wanna build up a lot of cells, which you then is manable to build the three germ layers in your system. And this process is gonna lead to the formation of blastomeres. Blastomeres are, you know, at one point, if you, for example, have eight cells, one of these cells is called a blastomere, which gives rise to the blastula in the end of cleavage. And roughly in all the species, the embryo overall volume is conserved, meaning that these div divisions are reductive in volume. Okay, so you get exponentially more cells because it's a synchronous deterministic cleavage, but they also become exponentially smaller. And it's composed of this minimal cell cycle, which we had, I think that was. Sorry, I didn't get the point. No, it's totally fine. Uh, so you said that the, there is a, there's an oscillation of the cell cycle, uh, cell division oscillator or something. So where does the uh, signal originate? So during, during fertilization, what's gonna happen is your sperm is gonna come in, and you're gonna have a calcium wave through your whole volume of your oocyte. Mm -hmm. And that calcium wave is gonna activate your cell cycle. Is it a specific um, molecular signal that gets the oscillator? Yeah, so we, I, I think two days ago, I talked about the CDK1 cyclin oscillator. That's exactly that. So, so when you have four, four cells, the yeah. embryos divide into four cells, where, where, where is the origin of the cells? The point is that you start your oscillator in a one cell stage, right? Like, so think about you have your biochemistry all in this volume of the one cell, and you start it. And in the end, once it started, you have a period and a frequency, right? A frequency and, an, and a phase, and it basically keeps running, okay. right? So you, even if you separate your cells, the oscillator already has been started, okay. and it's, and you know, it's the, it's precise enough in order to just keep the period and the oscillator. Thank you. And basically, it's composed of this minimal. There was another question. 
like at this stage, the cells haven't differentiated yet, right? Like they all have the same kind of um, uh, characteristics. They're exactly. So in, in zebrafish at that stage, um, they are all the same. They're not specified yet. They're going to specify around the thousand cell stage, but that's a species specific. So for example, in Drosophila or in C. elegans, you have something which we call an asymmetric cell division, which we're going to come later to it, where you already have a difference during the first cell division, meaning that one cell is different from the other. So it's already specified. But that is species specific when the specification happens. Sir, what are the cells labeled with here? So in this one, so I think the, the, the yellow one is a nuclei, and this one is a membrane marker. These are labeled with? Um, I don't know, I have to look it up, but I think it's probably like either pH domain, GFP, pH domains bind like a lipid, which is in the plasma membrane, or it could be some filamentous actin, which forms a cortex <laughs> below the membrane, but I know, I'm not exactly sure what it's labeled with. Yes. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. So, in, I mean, not specific to this particular thing, but all the other movies that you showed, this yeah. embryo is a closed system. It is as a for, right? um, for egg laying species, it is a closed, in, not completely because they exchange gases with their environment. Right, but there's nothing entering. There's, in terms, ex except oxygen and, uh, yeah, exactly. Like meaning, this. so all the, all the energetic stuff is in the yolk. Yeah, so for right? the egg laying species, like Xenopus zebra yeah. fish or the chicken, that is true. It's all in the yolk. So um, does this entire material get consumed? One, or, you know, is there still stuff left? So in other is, words, is the mother over uh, investing or under investing? Yeah, yeah. So it's usually, it has plenty, plenty, plenty of storage, right? So during the first 24 hours, you barely see a difference in the size of the yolk. So most of that energy is actually used for growth when the embryo starts really growing. And in zebrafish, for example, it's sufficient for like full development until the lava starts to feed, and then an additional day or two. So there is kind of like this fail safe in order for the lava to find food. And then in Drosophila, it's similar, right? Like it's um, when, you, when you form your lava after embryogenesis, it can crawl around a little bit, look for food, it still has some stuff in the gut. So there is some fail safe. So, and the point is the supply of energy is not limiting for development. Anyway. Yeah, I have another question, something I never thought about, which is in, in this process in which you preserve the total volume, you completely mess up the ratio between DNA and pro proteome. So how, how does the cell deal with that? So, yeah. you know, uh, the level of transcription of genes and so on should be completely altered at every mm -hmm. step. So the, the concentration, so in, a, in the beginning you have this big cell, right? Like, and then of course you make more cells and more nuclei, so your cytoplasmic to nuclear volume is gonna change. Right? Um, and the concentrations depending on the molecules is roughly constant, right? Depending, like some regulatory concentrations are the same. And the cytoplasmic to nuclear volume is important for developmental transitions. It's kind of read out. So there is, in the beginning, in these embryos, they don't transcribe their own genome. They are silent, right? But then there is a big transition happening at the end of cleavage, which we call the mid-blastula transition, where the embryo starts to activate its own genome and become self-sufficient. And there are different models how this transition is happening. How do you activate your genome? And one is to titrate away an inhibitor in the cytoplasm due to the exponential increase in the DNA. So, exactly. Exactly, but like then, I don't know if these YouTube videos, which I tried to post here, work, but this is a different species, this is now a frog. If you look across the element kingdom, we see that this cleavage process is very diverse. So right now, this is a frog embryo undergoing cleavage cell, cleavage stage division. And the difference between frogs and zebrafish is that the frogs completely divide the whole yolk and the whole volume. And the zebrafish 
have their cytoplasm on top and then they just divide on top of the yolk. However, they're still connected to the yolk, there's no membrane. This is what we call a meroblastic and a holoblastic division. But I just, you don't have to remember any, any of this, it's just what I wanted to say, if you look at a cross species, how you do cleavage can be very different. And the question is, of course, you know, how did this arise during the course of evolution and, you know, um, what is the advantage of certain species doing that way, if there even if there is an advantage. And similarly, there's another species, generally insects, where you don't have physical separation of your cells during cleavage stage development, but you have something which we call a syncytium. So basically you have your embryo and you have a single nuclei in this embryo, and this is one cell, and you only make more nuclei and more DNA without physically separating them through, through cytokinesis. So you generally increase your numbers of nuclei and then eventually you have enough of those, they all move to the periphery and then this process of cellularization is gonna happen where you're gonna form all your cell boundaries. But in principle, the principle is of all these species is that also for mammalian systems is you're going to form a ball of cells, which we call a blastula. Sometimes they have a lumen inside, sometimes they don't, but basically cleavage makes more cells. But then what are you going to do with these cells is going a process of now we have to start to specify it. And the first cell phase specification happens in the end of cleavage in order to form your three germ layers, the mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm, which is gonna give rise to different tissues and organs. And the, in zebrafish, you know, now you end up with this ball of cells here, and we're gonna watch again the process of gastrulation. So what you're gonna see is that this cells spread around the edges and eventually invaginate into the tissue. So these invagination of these, these cells gonna form the internal like the endoderm and the mesoderm. And the outer cells are gonna be the ectoderm and giving rise to outer organs. And of course, now the question is, you know, how does, do you form this ball of cells into um, an organized body plant? And this is the, what the first step is the, you know, the process of gastrulation. You form endoderm is inside, mesoderm is in the middle, and ectoderm is on the outside. And these germ layers now give rise to this massive, beautiful diversity of cell types we, ha we, we have and we also need in order to function properly. So for example, the mesoderm gives rise to your red blood cells, the ectoderm gives rise to the, your skin cells, and the endoderm, for example, gives rise to your digestive tissue, just as an example. And the process of gastrulation is actually a beautiful collective dynamics of cells. And there's a lot of work going now trying to understand the mechanics and the forces you need in order to undergo this process of gastrulation. So in the beginning in zebrafish during a process what we call epiboli is basically the isotropic spreading of your cells over the volume you have. And then the next step is the process of emboli, <coughs> which now leads to the initial internalization of these cells in order to form the internal structures like the mesoderm and endoderm. And at one point, what you want is then, you're gonna need to elongate your, elongate your axis and you have a ball of cells and you, there's different ways you can do this, but there's this beautiful cellular process, which we call conversion and extension, which I go into in a, a little bit in the next. But basically, you can do these processes, epiboli, emboli, and conversion and extension, is basically you can think of this as a, just like a simple geometric point. So you, you, at one point, you kind of extend, for example, your cells, but they're also gonna fit in. And eventually, what you want is doing the conversion extension, you make your, your, your cells intercalate, and you're gonna converge, and then you extend automatically. And you know, how do you, for example, doing empoli, you can go through these processes. For example, you, know, you can do radial intercalation in order to spread your cells. You can have, for example, shape changes of your cells. You can elongate and cross your axis. Or, for example, you could just like, you know, undergo migratory motion. 
And um, this is just another beautiful selective plane elimination microscopy image of this process of gastrulation. And, and at one point, you have the animal view from the top and the vegetable view from the side. And nuclei are labeled here. Right? And eventually, you can nicely see that these nuclei are going to spread over the embryo and going to internalize as well. And eventually, you're going to form your head and your tail down here. And during this process of cell spreading and conversion extension, you can really see how these cells now elongate. And you're going to have your body axis over here. And this is going to be the tail. And you can achieve this in, in different systems, achieve emboli very differently. So for example, in zebrafish, you have this cells at the edge, which are going to leave their epithelial organization and are just going to move down there. Um, in Drosophila, what you're going to do is in invagination. So you're going to have, you generate forces, constriction forces, and that leads to the invagination of these cells into the, into the embryo. Um, and you can watch this beautifully in a, in a Drosophila embryo. So you, what you're going to see here, again, is the nuclei labeled of a Drosophila embryo undergoing development. And if this movie is going to play, if we have um, connection, is what you're going to see here is now these the cells are labeled, and eventually they're going to constrict and evaginate into the embryo. I'm going to stratify. Now you can see them wriggling around already. And now they're going to invaginate here at the um is this is this uh, are these cells moving because they are pushing each other or like something else are driving force so normally on the like you have polarized cells so if you go here right so if you think about these now now think about not the embryo of what we looked from the bottom but look we just take a like a cut through the embryo right and you can see the cell layer that would go like this right and now where they invaginated what we saw in the movie is you're going to have these layer of epithelia here. And eventually, what you're going to do is you have, they are polarized, right? Like you have a, a bottom and a top, right? And eventually, you have your cytoskeleton machinery, which we call the active cytoskeleton and the active cortex. You, you got, what you're going to do is you're going to generate forces to constrict your apical area, right? And these forces are going to push these cells into the embryo. Some signals are deciding the, the red parts, or? There are signals um, doing that. And um, in, during this uh, gastrulation, are the cells uh, still exponentially? Um, no, like during gastrulation, usually overall, the mitotic rate in these embryos is very, very low. There are only very few cells <coughs> dividing. So what finished that cycle or like what will decide the, the end of the- To the stop, to stop To stop the exponential increase, yeah. yeah. So, there is, um, so for example, during this mid blastula transition, eventually you have only this cell cycle, which has this minimal S and M phase. And this is very, very different from the cell cycle we know because we have these gap phases. Right? And during the course of these exponential divisions and the zygotic genome activation, what you're going to do is you're going to, there are some signaling enzymes like checkpoint kinases coming up, which then, due to this transcription, leads to the lengthening of the cell cycle. And eventually, what you're going to achieve is this, you gain these gap phases. And that leads to really a long, much longer cell cycle phase. And there is regulation then. Then you have the possibility to regulate it and then you to turn it down. But if you want to know more, I'm happy to send you a couple of papers how that exactly works. Thank you. And then if you look at at um, frogs, they also initially have the cell spreading and then they start to dissociate and move. So what I wanted to just highlight here is that species do the same thing very differently. And in the end, basically what you can say is gastrulation is internalization of cross-sectoring tissues and many collective movements are required to spread the tissue. This is 
hippoboli and then internalization emboli, and then you have this conversion and extension to really form your anterior posterior axis. This is another movie of, of, of gastrulation of Xenopus. I think this didn't play. But basically, so there's also a very nice book up here, The Principles of Development by Scott Gilbert. And basically what you can really see here is this internalization of these cells and then the conversion extension of this embryo. And you can really see now this long axis of the embryo is gonna form in the beginning. It was really like a sphere. And now what you're gonna have is a nicely elongated one. And a, 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 this is the same process in a chicken. You can see here now you have this internalization of these cells around the hen's node. And you can also see that now it undergoes um, gastrulation. But then, right, like at one point to do this, you need cell fate specification. So there's something really interesting that cell fate specifications can be autonomous, conditional, or sensitive. So how do we figure these experiments out, right? Like, for example, you take a blastula, an embryo, right? And you take some cells, you take a mi microaspiration and take some cells, and you put it outside of the context of the embryo. So if it is already specified at that time, if you give it everything it needs, it will differentiate, for example, into a muscle or a neuron cell. However, specification can be also labile, right? Like you can take this out and you have either, um, you can be specified into a muscle cell change to a neuron, right? So for example, you take the cell, which sometimes in some species gives you always a muscle, somehow now it gives you urine and neuron. And this is what we call the, like there's autonomous, autonomous specification, right? Like it's really determined in, in, intrinsically in these cells. So for example, if you take here um, a cell out of the, out of the um, blastula of this species Pacella, it will always form these hairy-like cells, doesn't matter. And this is usually characteristic of, in, of um, invertebrates and this differential acquisition of cell phase is due to molecules already present um, once the egg is laid, and it happens before the cell migration. And these cells are just determined and cannot change that. On the other hand, right, what we, another, another way to do this is due to asymmetric cell division, right? Like how do you transport these molecules which determine the fate into your different cells? And I've mentioned C, um, C. elegans, during the first division, you're gonna have cell fate specification molecules, which during the division, get either put into the left cell or into the right cell, right? And then if, if, you, if you do this, the cell has all the determinants and the other one doesn't, and then you can change it. However, you're also gonna have conditions. Jonathan, yes. Yeah. So in the case of symmetric uh, cell division, Asymmetric cell division. Uh, symmetric. What do you mean? It's of symmetric. Yeah. How synchronous are the cell divisions? Uh, fairly, fairly synchronous. It's like um, synchronous to what? Right, like to the length of the cell cycle. That's what we call. So, four divided into eight. Eight. It happens within in zebrafish within two one minute. Right, like it's not perfectly synchronous. Is um, is but it's fairly synchronous. Now, what you can also do is to determine, you know, you have this conditional specification, right? So normally, if you take a blastula cell and you know what these cells become, you can now take them out of an embryo and they will be always become these kind of cells in, the, in these frog embryos. Now you can take them out and put them in a different blastula in a different position, right? And now you put these cells, which you know are normally always forming a muscle, and now you put them in a different position and now they're gonna form a neuron. So this tells you that they are not determined yet when you took them out. However, their fate or their specification depends on the location where they are. 
that's what we call a conditional specification, and that is characteristic of most, most vertebrates. And that specification happens by cell-cell interactions, and the position is important, there's a typo in here, um, happens before or during cell movements, and cells can acquire different um, states and functions. And you can also do pretty cool things. It's like the question is now, what determines the location or what determines why this location gives rise to these cell types and another location doesn't? And there's this famous um, spearman mungold experiment um, where they discovered as the ball of cells, which we call the organizer. And the organizer can tell cells what to become. Right? And for example, the organizer in the zebrafish is lo localized here during the beginning of gastrulation. You can take these cells out and put it on another embryo on the other side where the other organizer is already present. Right? And what's going to happen is you're going to form an embryo with two heads. Right? So that really tells you that these cells can tell the other cells to become something they shouldn't become, and then you form two heads. And so, you can do, yeah. It's not like uh, the, this organizer cell is kind of, um, it's unique right from the start, or does it kind of? The organizer is also being determined during development. Okay. Um, but it's, um, there's other, eventually you have, a sim you have symmetry breaking, and eventually this organizer is going to form, and I come to a little bit how this is going to work, but not too much into detail. But you can do this experiment a little bit more crazy, right? Like you don't have to put it on this one side, but you can also put it on different sides of the embryo. And you can at one point say like, you know, you form a second tail. It either is oriented anterior, posterior, or you put it on this side and you form very, very crazy kind of um, zebrafish embryo. It's mostly used in vertebrates, yeah. So why isn't it in the other, like, lower? So why questions are always super hard to answer. And I, why, I don't know, why is it not present in, in the other species? Jonathan, uh, how do they know exactly to form a second tail or a second head or a second, whichever appendage exactly. is? Exactly, you can see these molecules here, nodal and BMP, right? So these are... Um, Morphogens, right? And I think we briefly heard about morphogens um, and the French flag model, and it's also really important for reaction diffusion systems. But basically, morphogens are signaling molecules which are secreted by a ball of cells and then spread around that ball of cells in a dimension, anterior and posterior. And then based on the concentration of this morphogen, if the concentration of this morphogen is, close, is higher, closer to the source, then it is away from the source, right? And cells have a way to read out this concentration in order to say, now I'm close to the source or far away from the source, which gives you automatically dimensions. And of course, there's a lot of work now we can do. We can do these morphogen gradients more quantitatively. So you can define this concentration as an exponential decaying function with a, with a um, characteristic length scale. And then you can you can also try to, you know, see, you know, see, use this model to quantify your system. If you know, you can measure concentrations. You can really develop quantitative models, and this is what people are currently doing, trying to understand how this dimension is and how it scales. For example, with the growing tissue size stuff. So, for example, the characteristic length scale in a lot of these different systems scales with the tissue size. So you will always have the same um, kind of model. Of course, we also have sensitual specification. And um, I was wondering that when you talk about morphogens yeah. um, in a zebrafish, for example, which is in water. It's in water. Why doesn't the morphogen diffuse away ah, no, from no, no, the no. other but side? In zebrafish, one of the earliest specification, I find a zebrafish here. Well, for example, here you can see like one of the earliest specification is the envelope layer. So you're going to form a layer of epithelial cell, very thin epithelial cells, around your blastula. So there is no diffusion away of these. 
But of course, sometimes these morphogens are also internal in the intracellular space and interact with the extracellular matrix in order to, you know, you restrict diffusion and that whole thing. So the environment in which these morphogens spread is important. And in insects, we have this, um, or mainly in insects, um, we have what we call the sensitual um, specification. It's a particular type of, because we don't have cells, right? It's, you can think about an asymmetric cell division without division, because what's gonna happen is you can, in this sensitium, you're gonna localize part of your signaling molecules to either the posterior or the anterior end, which then leads to intracellular morphogen gradients. For example, from the anterior to the posterior, before you have even cellularized, you have a lot of nuclei, but you have organized your molecules on one side so it's the other, so you have this intracellular morphogen gradient. And this will eventually form to greater gene expression in these nuclei when the, once the genome is active, and you're gonna form these beautiful rhodophila stripes um, and to build the body. And of course, you all heard about, you know, induced pluripotent stem cells. We can now reverse this specification and take a skin cell and give them four factors via viral expression, and we can, for example, take a skin cell and make it into an in induced pluripotent stem cell, and if we understand how they specify, we can give them different molecules in order to, for example, in vitro, make a muscle cell. And that's just developmental biology 101, right? And in our lab, of course, now, if you think about cells, also embryos, similar, we had this already, we need to drive this beautiful process of embryonic development while using metabolism to transform energy and matter in order to build design. And if you look at metabolism during development, this is, it's interesting that uh, metabolism is not this homogeneous um, um, cellular network of chemical reactions which is present in all cells, but it also is patterned within a developing tissue. So for example, if you now look at this old data here from Drosophila, so this is what we call the primordial tissue of the wing of the fly which is gonna form, which we call a wing imaginator. And it has all these beautiful morphogens which give the discs the dimensions. But if you now look at the activity of different metabolic enzymes in this tissue, while using, like what these guys did is they used a colorimetric change in response to the activity of a particular enzyme. So for example, if you look here at two enzymes which are involved in this pentose phosphate shunt, or you know, part of the glycolytic, or like a, a branch of the glycolytic pathway, you can really see that these two enzymes have a very, very specific spatial patterning of their metabolic activity. Similarly, if you look here at an enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase, it's a TCA cycle enzyme, you can already see that it's active almost everywhere except this little stripe at the anterior posterior. Another example is, for example, once you form your segments or your vertebrae, is in a mouse or in a chicken embryo, what we know is that there's a graded activity of glycolytic activity originating from the posterior end while you form your segment. So somehow glyco glycolysis is in these cells have a lower flux than glycolysis in those cells. Similarly, we kind of have this empirical observation that it highly proliferated cells, like the cancer cells or even stem cells, which divide very, very fast, have a more glycolytic metabolism than an oxidative metabolism. What do I mean with more is, right, like your glucose comes in and it can go either complete oxidation to CO2 and water, um, or you can do fermentation, right, like this regeneration of your redox potential forming lactate. So these guys produce usually a lot more lactate. However, it doesn't mean that your mitochondria are not active. They're also active, but it's just on top of and, you, and then more differentiated cells are generally 
you know, post mitotic and they basically just burn everything in your mitochondria. Also during early embryonic development, there is this observation that when you start from a one cell stage, for example, in the mouse embryo, and also it's present in a lot of different species, your initial glycolytic flux is low. However, you divide very, very rapidly, but you also don't grow mass, right? And then here you have more oxidative metabolism. And then while just prior, you have your blastocyst, and prior to this increased growth of mammalian species, these cells become more glycolytic. Also, your ultrastructure from the mitochondria is changing. So you have this tiny fragmented classical textbook mitochondria, but over the course of development, you can see that these mitochondria form more networks and become more elegant. I'm just gonna skip this. And then now the, the current question is, right? Like, you know, you have, um, you know, your regulation of metabolism in time and in space. And the question now is, what is, why, why are these, why is metabolism patterned, or can we understand what, you know, what this patterning is good for? And then there's, of course, what people at one point wrote is there's an emergent, an emerging view emphasizes that bioenergetic activities are highly regulated both in space and in time in order to match constant con context dependent cellular demands. The point is that what are context cellular demands? We, I think what we lack at the moment is a quantitative <coughs> understanding what are these demands are during embryonic development, and maybe we can use these demands in order to further understand why metabolism is doing what it is. And of course, these are the questions we are interested in the lab. And you know, on the one hand, on the scale of embryos and on the scale of cells, what we want to understand is you know, how much energy does an embryo elect, do you need it doesn't, it doesn't embryo need in order to stay alive and how much more energy is required to go through these different beautiful phases of embryonic development. And if we understand them, can we, for example, maybe understand or investigate, you know, the diversity of different developmental modes? Do they all have the same cost or different costs? And can we also use this then to think about these beautiful patternings of metabolism in time and in space, and then maybe start to build energy budgets of different cellular processes during this developmental phase. But in order to do this, we have to measure something, right? And if we think conceptually what metabolism is, right, like you have your substrates, which then, what we learned, get converted into cellular energy currencies the embryo can use, and by catabolic reactions to build these energy currencies like ATP or reducing equivalent, which then is used to drive these anabolic reactions, building embryonic structure, and to also you know, provide the energy for all the active, beautiful active matter cell biology is happening. And conceptually, you can think of that, you know, the zygote has all these nutrients, and together with the substrate, it's gonna form embryonic structures and metabolic products over time. And this is characterized by a certain parameter space. For example, we have these classical parameters like, you know, let's measure how much oxygen they consumed during this transition, how much fermentation products they made, how much ATP did they use, for example, or what any other kind of other metabolism. But we also want to understand this from the laws of thermodynamics, right? Like, can we characterize this as like how much free energy has been dissipated to the environment, how much free energy has been consumed, how much of that is enthalpy and how much of that is chemical. So now we are faced with this problem is like first we have to somehow start to think about how can we measure these quantities. And there are different approaches one can use to measure different quantities. Um, and the first one I wanna to talk to you about is heat, right? At a constant pressure you know, and the law Hess tells us that the heat dissipated is equal to the enthalpy change of every chemical reactions times their rate, right? The heat dissipation rate. And the first calorimeter was actually developed by Lavoisier and Laplace in the, in the late 1800s. And the way the system is working, you have your experimental cell and then you have a thin sheet of ice around it. And whatever you're gonna put in this experimental cell and it's gonna generate heat, it's gonna melt the ice. And basically, of the volume of the melted ice, you can back calculate how much heat the system gave you. 
And interestingly, at this time, they were also interested in the genetics of biological systems. So what they did is they put a guinea pig into this ice colorimeter and measured how much heat they dissipated. And they also measured oxygen consumption and CO2 production. And what they concluded is, yes, life, what we know today as respiration, is exactly the analogy of a chemical combustion reaction. Of course, modern day calorimeters look different. So this is the calorimeter we have in the lab and Shashi also has is, is the calorimeter from a company called um, Thermal Analysis or TA. And it basically looks like a big washing machine. Right? And why is it so big is these are individual calorimeter units, but it's surrounded by a massive oil bath. So what you want is you want to keep your system at isothermal conditions. And of course, if you want to measure heat or temperature differences, you don't want your environment interfere with your temperature measurements. And so you want to keep your temperature very, very close. And the system can achieve millikelvins um, temperature stability due to this oil bath. But then you have these little calorimeter units in here. And calorimetry, you know, is an overall, I just um, took this from the, from the company's book. They refer as, as a measuring technique that uses the direct determination of heat production, heat, and heat capacity as a function of temperature or time. And the beauty is that you know it's non it's non-specific. You don't need la it's label free. So any chemical reaction or any physical process or anything you can think of which undergoes a chemical reaction or transition which is associated with the heat, you can measure. It's non-specific, it's non-destructive, and it doesn't depend on the physical shape of the sample. So basically, you can put anything you want in a color. Um, if you think about a chemical reaction, right? we have a chemical reaction where a certain chemical gets turned over with a certain rate. We can think the power consumption is proportional to the rate change of the concentration times the enthalpy of that reaction. So the, the power you're going to measure in your calorimeter is the enthalpy times the rate times the function of the concentration. The point is that calorimetry then gives you, in the end, what you're going to measure is a rate. Right? So what you can measure is a heat flow rate of your chemical reaction between the environment. And you can plot this rate, for example, against time. Or you plot the integral of the total energy released over time. And this gives you a little bit of an extent of the reaction. And you can plot these two against each other. So you can take the time domain away and plot it against the total energy released against the heat flow, which gives you the extent of the reaction of the system, as well as how, how fast the rate is going to change as a function of concentration. There's one problem with colorimetry. Well, not a problem, but you have to be aware of, is that it measure, it's unspecific, right? It measures every change of heat in your system. So imagine now you have your embryo in your colorimeter or a chemical reaction, and you have something else, you've been sloppy or something else that's going to produce a constant heat, right? You could have, for example, your lid is not a chemical equilibrium, it's going to relax. Any physical process will give you some heat. But it's additive, so basically... You're going to measure everything, but you just have to make sure that you know there's some caveats to it. Um, then there, there are different calorimeters, but let's just go to this classical one. So you have um, what we call it's what we call a nano module, but basically you have two channels, channel A and B. And the way the system is working is basically you have this two channels where you have this business end of the calorimeter sitting down, which is surrounded by this oil bath giving an isothermal concentration, and you have usually your sample in an ampule, and these two channels, are con like both are connected to a thermoelectric module, and you use the Zeebeck effect, right? So if you have a temperature difference between the environment and your system, you can induce um, some electric current and voltage, and you can amplify the signal and then deduct how much the temperature difference was. And as the, if you, for example, have an exothermic reaction, this heat is flowing to the, to the buff, and you can read this out. And you can do this for both of the channels, your reference and your experimental system. And then you can plot the delta, which then is the, the, power, the power of your 
for Jonathan, what's the sample preparation protocol for this? As in, if we want to do it for a mammalian cell culture system or embryos in this case, or is it at a you know cellular level also we can extract the information? Or? We can go down. We cannot single cells. We cannot do yet, um, but we can do roughly five to ten thousand cells, and you have these little glass ampules, um, and. Basically, if your cells are happy in these glass ampules under these conditions, you can measure the heat sources. And in the beginning, you normally we do this, but you normally do a little lot of different control experiments um, in order to make make sure that your cells are growing under similar conditions than they would grow outside. And if you achieve these conditions in the colorimeter, you can go on and measure the heat sources. Right. So, uh, in case uh, suppose I talk about the mammalian cell culture system, and if there is contamination then even bacterial cells will start growing. Yeah. So uh, is there a way to, you know, an insulator or, you know, any sterile environment or it's... Uh... Right. Like you can make your ampules sterile, you can take them under the hood and then put your cells in there. And you will see if your color room, you will see in your heat flow data, way before you're going to see that your culture is contaminated, you know your culture is contaminated because bacteria produce way more heat. So eventually you're going to have your mammalian cells growing and eventually you're going to see a massive exponential growth curve on top of that. And that's going to tell you, okay, I have bacteria in my cells. And this is also colorimetry is used, for example, um, for sterile testing for medical research. Right? Right? If you want to make sure that your sample is sterile, and then sometimes how do companies make sure that they are sterile for a long time? They don't really necessarily known. It's the time of detection they need in order to figure out. So colorimetry is used in, for example, if you prepare media and you sell it to your customers, they take samples of that media and put it in the colorimeter for two or three weeks. Because the detection limit, the early detection limit of the colorimetry is much better than any other detection. And then, for example, if we now, for example, take a yeast cell, yeast, and put it in a colorimeter and you measure the heat dissipation over time, and you can see that this is usually a trajectory you normally get from a growing culture of yeast in your colorimeter. Um, and this is the corresponding cell number. And again, what colorimetry really is measuring is the rate of, you know, the enthalpy change of every chemical reaction in your system times two. And of course, you can now, if you integrate this, you basically get a classical growth curve. And you can use this data now, you know, to make inference, right? Like, you know, to put it on a different conditions and to try to figure out how can we link these overall dissipation in the form of heat down to the metabolism we have. Um, and I don't know, Pablo, is if you, you're here, but um, um, yeah, I don't know how much you're going to talk about this on. All right, okay, cool. But basically, what you can do now is you can think of you know, if you grow your cell in a minimal media, right, and you know what you put in, you can make an enthalpy, when what comes out, you can make an enthalpy balance around your colony of growing cells, right? And what you can say is that the law of Hess tells us that the heat is, you know, constant pressure is the enthalpy change, so we can write the sum of the flux of the enthalpy contained in the molecules coming into the system, plus the sum of the negative flux of the product coming out in this enthalpy content of these molecules, the enthalpy of formation, plus a term which is dependent on the growth rate, which is the enthalpy conserved into biomass. And how this usually looks like is you write down a macrochemical equation, for example, here for the aerobic growth of yeast. So, for example, you have, um, this is partially, like it's glucose, but it's written in per carbon mole plus some nitrogen source, some oxygen gives you biomass, CO2, and water. And you can measure certain, and now you normalize your, your, your stoichiometry coefficients, and, and now look at yield coefficients, ratio of fluxes. And you can measure, for example, the biomass flux, and you can solve the stoichiometry and make an enthalpy balance, and compare that enthalpy balance to your measured heat. Or you can also use the heat to constrain the enthalpy balance. And then what you end up with and you can solve this system, you can end up with, in the beginning, these cells had so much glucose, and what they initially do is they produce a lot of ethanol in the ferment, and they produce some heat, 
and eventually going to produce some cells too. So you can really now do an enthalpy and allocation model of these reactions, and it gives you quantitative data. And if this enthalpy balance matches, you can also calculate the free energy change and the chemical entropy change of that. But of course, this is bacteria, and what we want to do is to do this on embryos. And I think what Shurit is going to do later with you is we have a lot of heat dissipation data of embryos of different species going through development. And this is ongoing research, right? Like we also try to do certain inferences and these microchemical equations is eventually where we want to end up with, but we're not there yet. But what we can do is relate these heat dissipation to other, other parameters like morphometric parameters or stuff we know and see what kind of features do you see. And this is, I think, today, Shurit has some data from Drosophila. And then tomorrow, we, you know, we, the, all this data is available if you want to play with it. We also have other data, morphometric parameters. And then we can see what, we can, what kind of relationships do we see, and can we make inference about the underlying costs of cellular processes. But of course, this is only heat. And then another, you can measure, for example, also oxygen consumption. And the classical way you can make oxygen consumption is in the respirator. Uh, before we move along, so these calorimeters are capable of full incubation, so you can control the temperature, gases, and everything, so you can grow the cells in whatever environment you want? In theory, yes. So all this data comes from closed systems, so there's no gas exchange. But we know that under these conditions, at least for the 24 hours, oxygen is not limited. Okay. Thank you. But in principle, you can, for example, if we go back, is you have different different modules here you can put in this calorimeter where you have, for example, peristaltic pumps, so you could do media perfusion, or you have mass flow controllers where you can then, you know, put gas, exchange gases down here in this chamber. But you always have to be careful is, for example, if your gas is dry and you put it in a very humid environment down there, what's going to happen is it's going to evaporate. And evaporation is then, you know, it's going to, you know, cool you down, right? So be careful. <laughs> Jonathan, I didn't exactly get the graph that showed uh, ethanol. You said no? in the beginning, ethanol uh, will be formed. This one here? Yeah, so glucose, ethanol cells, heat, I didn't understand. Okay, so basically, you have a lot of glucose in the beginning, and your cells going to start growing, right? And, or like, you know, you have the lag phase over here. This is in hours. And eventually, they're going to consume some of that glucose. And you can allocate the enthalpy in the glucose in either into cells, into heat, or into some fermentation product like ethanol. And normally, if you grow yeast under, under conditions in the system, what they're first going to do is, for whatever reason, they're going to ferment first, right? They're going to produce ethanol. Does that make sense? You allocate these energy and glucose into all these different, and you can make this balance. Of course, you can also measure oxygen, and this is the classical way, like the old school way, how you measure oxygen. For example, you know, you have your little insect in here, and you have a manometer. It's just like a colored tube of liquid. And basically, if this, what you want to do is you have some, some, some base in the bottom because you have another gas in your system, which is CO2. Right? And the system's producing CO2, and you don't want to measure CO2. So what it happens, the CO2 is reacting with this, this, with this base, and you basically capture all the CO2 away. And you do this on both sides. And then you have your process of interest in here or something else over here, which is just a similar mass. And now this stuff is going to produce oxygen, and it's going to induce a pressure change, and your liquid is going to move away. That's just the old school way how we can measure oxygen. Of course, nowadays, we do it differently, right? Like we can use clock type, type electrodes, where we can use electrochemistry of oxygen in order to induce a voltage, and then we can use that to measure the partial pressure of oxygen or the concentration, because we know the salinity of your media. And this is classically what we now call like a respirometer system, an electron-based system. Where, for example, here this is plant cells, and you have an inlet and an outlet, and we can use this electrode to measure the oxygen production in terms of time. Of course, there's other, like this is currently, if you want to do isolated mitochondria or anything else, this is currently the state-of-the-art system, which is also an electrode-based system. It's called from, from Ouroboros oxyograph, and it basically works the same way, but 
You can also inject other things into the system. You also have a reference cell, so you can compare um, reference to an experiment. But nowadays, well, another way to do this is use fluorescence, right? Like, so you have these little fluorescent chemical molecules, which its fluorescent or its phase of the fluorescence is proportional to the oxygen concentration in the media. So basically, you can use light and as a readout for oxygen concentration in the system. And the most promising one is when you hear biologists talk about the seahorse, they don't mean the seahorse per se, but they usually mean this machine, which is called seahorse bioanalyzer, which measures oxygen concentration. And basically, the way the system is working, you have your um, fluorescent, system, fluorescent um, chemical in the bottom, and you can form, you have your cells growing in here, and you can form this little plunger, a little microchamber, and your system is going to consume oxygen over time. So the system then is going to measure the oxygen partial pressure in the system as a function of time, usually three minutes, and then you have a linear, usually a linear decay. You fit that, and you get your oxygen consumption. And you can also fit this with um, injection ports, so you can do experiments by injecting different ports. Um, and a classical experiment, what you do is usually um, trying to figure out, um, you know, your mitochondrial function. And we, I don't know how much detail we had about the respiratory chain, right? But it's usually you transport your electrons down your, your um, redox potential, and you also do the stepwise transport of your electrons using this energy release in order to pump protons. You charge your biological battery through these processes, and these protons can then flow through back to your ATP synthase in order to make ATP. And what you want to do is basically, usually this is proportional to the oxygen consumption rate, similarly to this coarse grain model, what um, Jingbo did in vivo, measuring NADH lifetime. So basically, you have a basal respiration. And at one point, you want to know how much of that basal respiration we can conceptually associate with ATP production. And then you, what you're going to use is a drug which blocks the ATP synthase. And that, of course, leads to a hyperpolarization of your membrane potential. And eventually, the, your NADH electrons cannot um, pump more protons against this gradient, which is hyperpolarized, right? So the force is too high. And eventually, this leads to reduction in oxygen production and oxygen consumption. And then you can see how this oxygen consumption in response to this drug changes. And you say, and the interpretation is that this is the amount of oxygen due to ATP production. The next experiment, what you do is then afterwards, you uncouple your membrane potential. Right? So what you're going to do is you use this drug, for, which is called a ionophore, which forms a little hole in your inner mitochondrial membrane. And all of your protons are going to flow through the hole. So it's a futile cycle. You introduce a futile cycle, because what the biology tries to do is restore your uncoupled membrane potential and tries to pump as much protein as it can. So this is what you call then the maximum capacity or respiratory rate of your mitochondria. This is why the oxygen consumption in response to uncoupling shoots up. And the next experiment is now you can kill the whole respiratory chain. Basically, you kill complex one where the electron enters via NADH, and then you kill complex three. And now this respiration rate is going to go to a basal zero level, and you assume that these drugs are 100%, so all the mitochondrial oxygen consumption is killed. And that, what you then call this level, um, the level which is left is, of course, is always a little 5% in the mammalian system, which is there's some oxygen consumption which is not linked to mitochondrial respiration. For example, sterile biosynthesis uses a lot of oxygen or peroxidome lipid oxidation uses some oxygen. And that's the basal mitochondrial respiration rate. And from this delta between oligomycin and the, the general thing, you can also calculate there's always some intrinsic leak of protons going through the membrane because the membrane is not perfect insulated. Does that make sense? And you can do this. They also sell because what the system is also doing is not only measuring oxygen, but it can also measure pH, okay? And pH, extracellular pH around the cells, can be also used as a readout of fermentation, but only fermentation where you're going to produce an acid. 
right? And in our systems, when we ferment, we produce lactate, and lactate is an acid, and it can dissociate and give rise to a protein, which is going to lead to a pH change. And the system, this is what they call the ECA, the extracellular acidification rate. And then this, the unit is milli pH per minute, but basically what you can use this is as a proxy readout of fermentation. However, you have to be careful to interpret this data because not all the pH change is going to come from lactate. And if you're ever going to do a seahorse experiment is in respiration, you produce CO2. And what happens if you throw CO2 in water? It's going to form HCO3 minus NH plus, and it's an equilibrium. So you're also going to have a pH change of your respiration. So you always have to do the control experiments to interpret this pH change to know how much of this pH change comes from respiration. Okay. And if you have done this experiment, you can, for example, take your, your cells and inject glucose and see how much, what is the pH change according to this injection of glucose. You can then, you, you also kill the respiration, for example, and then normally you have a compensatory response. If your mitochondria have a problem, you ramp up, a lot of cells ramp up their glycolysis in order to compensate for the loss or the reduction. And then you can kill with the drug, you can kill your gly glycolysis and you do a similar inference of what these experiments mean. Okay, so now what is if you wanna make measure other metabolites, right? So for example, what we also often use in the lab is kits, right? And kids, oh, there's beautiful solution A and solution B, and it gives us some beautiful light, and we make some inference. Right? But normally, the way the system is using it, for example, if I want to measure lactate, I can use chemistry and can couple the chemistry of lactate to something which gives us like a fluorescent change or a colorimetric change. So, for example, here I can use an enzyme which is called lactate oxidase, which uses oxygen to produce hydro hydrogen peroxide which I then can use by another enzyme to produce a colorimetric change or luminescent change. So if I, for example, take my cells, I grind them up, and then if I want to measure how much lactate there is, I can use this, um, these enzyme-coupled reactions, and I have a standard curve, and I can deduct the concentration. Similarly, I could do this for, with fluorescence. Yeah. To measure the lactate, is it necessary to... Uh like, you know, lyse the cells and then collect the supinatant or whatever is released in the media, only, uh, you know, measuring the lactate from the media will also be a good readout. Like, which is a better uh, experiment for lactate? What do you think? Um, it will be released. So probably the extra cell, I mean, the media is good enough. But if you lyse the cells, then I'm not sure if, you know, anything else, because there's a lot of other... Uh, acidic substances as well. So lysosomal contents and all of them might, you know. And of course, it depends on the question, right? Like if you, if you want to know how much lactate is, are these cells spitting out, I never do a time course and I want to have a rate, then of course I try to get rid of my cells and I try to not break them, right? And only measure the lactate in the media. Um, and there I would probably use an, a kit or probably maybe HPLC or something like that. But if you want to know what the steady state concentration of lactate is in your cells or the amount, then of course you need to do that. Another way how we usually measure small molecules um, is via chromatogra chromatography and different detectors. Right? So for example, your lactate, you could also not measure with a kit, but you could also um, measure lactate via what we call high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC. And the way the system is working, I normally have my lactate in your solution, and you have some sort of solvent, and you add your, your lactate or your dissolved lactate on top of a stationary phase. It can be anything. Right? It could be some hydrophobically charged molecule, some hydrophilically charged molecule. And then you have your solvent you put on top, and your protein, or like your protein or your small molecule or nothing, something else, is going to physically interact with your stationary phase as a function of the mobile phase or the chemical environment you get from the mobile phase. So, for example, if you have a very hydrophobic molecule and you have a very hydrophobic stationary phase, it's going to take a long time for this molecule to flow through your stationary phase. 
And then you can collect your phases and then use certain kind of detectors to see um, your molecule. And this can be also quantitative because you can, for example, put different concentrations of your lactate and you know your molecule, what you're looking at. And, um, and then whatever kind of detector you're using, you can calibrate. And some common detectors are UV light, so you can make light, like absorption, infrared light, refractive index, light scattering, and a common technique is mass spectrometry. But normally what you're gonna end up is with something like, this is what we call a chromatogram. And basically what you're gonna have is, you know, you have time, so it, how long does it take for my molecule to go, go through the stationary phase? And then my detector gives me a sum readout and it's gonna give you peak. I don't know, this is characterized by an average peak height. This is what we call a retention time. And the dead time is like at one point you need to have your mobile phase come back. Of course, what we now do is, you know, if you wanna do metabolomics or mass spectrometry, what you're gonna do is you're gonna couple your chromatography, that could be either gas chromatography or liquid chromatography, couple this as a detector you use a mass spectrometer. Right? And, and then at one point you're gonna get a, end up with a chromatogram, so basically your attention times and your mass spectrum. This is a very simple mass spectrometer. So basically you have, you ionize your molecule and then you shoot it probably to a, no, but can you explain a bit why, what's the retention time and what's the, why do you call it a chromatogram? Because it's a chromatography, right? Like, what do you, what do you exact, exactly see in a chromatogram? So basically you have your detector signal, right? And your detectors over time, right? And eventually what you're gonna do is you're gonna add your molecule. Eventually you have your, your, your column and you're gonna flow through um, um, your molecule or your, your extract from your cells together with a solvent, right? Acetonic nitrile or methanol or something like that. And eventually what's gonna happen is your stationary phase has either a lot of hydrophobic react, um, you know, molecules or hydrophilic molecules. And then your molecules of interest or all the molecules in your sample are gonna physically interact with the stationary phase, okay? Based on the environment you're giving with the mobile phase. And so first what's gonna happen is all the molecules which are not reacting or not physically interact with this column are gonna just rapidly flow through the system, okay? And this is what, you got, what we call the, de the, 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 the flow through or the dead time, right? And then there's a lot of stuff coming through which doesn't interact, which you usually maybe you, depending what you want to detect. Right? But then your molecules or your different molecules are gonna interact with the stationary. And depending on the interaction strength, it takes longer time for your molecule or shorter time to pass through this column. And then also to pass through the detector. And this is what we call the retention time. How long does it take a molecule to pass through your column? And this is the time until your molecule is gonna come, and then you're gonna detect this molecule with a peak height. And this peak height is usually proportional to your amount of molecule coming at the time. Almost done. So basically, then you can use a mass spectrometer, and you have your molecules coming at different times into your mass spectrometer based on the retention time, and you can record this. And then you ionize this molecule and you shoot it up into a mass spectrometer and you have usually a magnet and then the, the, the what we call it, it flies through the detector system and then depending on the mass charge ratio, we can detect it then in the end and amplify the signal. Jonathan, how do you go from solvent phase to ion phase? So, um, so basically, it goes to, you have ionization sources, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm not a mass spec expert, right? I don't, it's a spray, right? Like you spray, electron spray, and then you have high, high voltage and you ionize the system. Uh, I was asking because in the, in the chromatography, yeah. uh, you have the solvent phase, right? So when you are separating in the, in the column. Exactly. You are pushing a solvent. So then at some point you have to remove the solvent somehow and then ionize it? Or it depends. 
but necessarily not, right? Like solvent is, you can also have, the solvent will also give you a mass spectrometry peak, but it's so like, very small, right? If you have acetate or nitrile or methanol, yeah, you just blow it up and probably breaks and forms something weird. So. Hmm? The peak area is your amount of molecule. Basically, what you're then going to end up with, and this is where then data analysis comes in. I'm almost done. Um, data analysis comes in. You have um, basically your retention times of your different molecules. And then in the other dimension, you have the mass charge ratio of the, these molecules, which all have been in this same peak. And then you try to identify what molecule is the certain mass charge ratio. And there are, we have isomers. So molecule have a certain mass charge ratio, but it can be five different molecules. And the challenge then lies to tell you what molecule it is. And this is where all the computational and, and stuff comes in. But then what you can do is, for example, if you do this for, the, for, your, meta, for your central carbon metabolism, put steady state levels or relative changes. So normally you do treated versus untreated. You do relative changes, but there's also possibility to do absolute changes. Exactly, and so basically the whole workflow is, you know, it sounds so easy, yeah, we did metabolomics, but it actually is a lot of work. Anyway, I'm just going to stop here, and then if there's any more questions, let me know. Sorry, does the shape of peak area tell anything? The shape? Yeah. Um, yeah, like sometimes you have much wider and wider shapes or with the tail. And it's usually, it's, it's, if you have similar molecules with the same physical properties going to interact with your, with your stationary thing. This is like an ideal example if you would have one molecule um, and they interact really well and you chose your column right and you chose your mobile phase right, then you get a very nice peak. But often what happens is that you get a broad peak with a tail or... And something else is usually if it's not, if you, especially if you have mixtures of many. Thank you, sir. So in the um, part where you showed that the mitochondrial uh, dynamics change with development and they can become more fused in. So can it be deterministic in the sense that you change the mitochondrial dynamics and then it affects the stage of development as well? In the... Yes and no. Yeah. Of course, always just the problem is with metabolism, right? Like if you kill mitochondria and they're important in general, right? Like you're going to kill your cells. Of course, you're going to affect development. So at one point, um, what people are trying to do is, for example, you have is this interesting <coughs> observation that you have mitochondrial enzymes, which are normally mitochondrial, are localized to the nucleus during development or early development. Right? And there, um, you could imagine, and it has been shown that these mitochondrial enzymes generate certain substrates which are important for gene regulation. So there, yes, right? And there's also evidence, for example, um, during, during this gastrulation in, in the fly, right? Like during this massive constriction, some mitochondria in space move close to the apical side because you have a lot of actomyosin activity, which requires quite a lot of ATP. So if you prevent these mitochondria moving there, you have problems doing this invagination. Questions? If not, we thank Jonathan thank for the very nice lecture. And now we have a coffee break and we reconvene in half an hour.